to Medicine for These Times. I'm Beth Weinstein. Today's guest I'm so excited to finally connect with after trying to get an interview. There's been a back and forth, but we have Dr. Catherine McLean with us. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And this is a much better time to get me. I'm relaxed. I'm happy. I I just got my book out. So this is this is way better than January or February. So yeah. <laughs> So good, and we're going to get into this and hear more about your book, but congratulations. I know this is so huge, and, you know, it's it's. I know I've been following your work for a while, and it's kind of like this book has been in you, and I, I have that feeling, right, that it's been in you for years. Yes, it has. <laughs> it's my third child, basically. Um, exactly. That's it. It's exactly like birthing a child, right? Well, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about your background, then we'll get into your, your work and your story. But Dr. Catherine McLean is a neuroscientist with expertise in studying the effects of mindfulness meditation and psychedelics on cognitive performance, emotional well-being, spirituality, and brain function. As a postdoctoral research fellow and faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, she conducted clinical trials of psilocybin, the primary chemical found in magic mushrooms, and other psychedelic compounds. Her groundbreaking research on psilocybin and personality change suggests that psychedelic medicines can enhance openness to new experiences and promote mental health and emotional well-being throughout the lifespan. Dr. McLean co-founded and directed the first Center for Psychedelic Education and Training in New York and was featured in the New Yorker article entitled The Trip Treatment by Michael Pollan, and her TED Talk has been viewed nearly 50,000 times. Midnight Water is her first book. So um, can I call you Catherine sure. or Dr. Catherine McLean? Catherine, Catherine, Catherine is great. Great. So Catherine, I always love to know, you know, how did you get into your line of work? You know, what even took you into going and getting a doctorate and becoming a neuroscientist and, you know, going into psychedelics. And I'm curious how psychedelics might have played a part in your own personal journey. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, one of the parts that I usually leave out of this story, I've decided to start being more open about because I think um, a lot of people are now facing the choice of like what medicine is right for me. And interestingly, when I was about 17 or 18, um, like many American high school, college kids, I was introduced to alcohol. And what I didn't know about myself was that I really wanted to transcend reality in my body. So that meant I drank a lot when I did drink. It was really dangerous. And so interestingly, as a freshman at Dartmouth, I, um, I got busted twice in a row, once for having a party in my dorm room and another for trying to get home from a frat very drunk. And so because I got two strikes, they're like, third strike, you're like suspended from college. And I was like valedictorian. I was on the track team. I was like, this is not going to go over well. So I had to do basically like a rehabilitation education class. And that's when I learned that there were so many better drugs out there. So in a funny way, it's like alcohol kind of did its part to get me on the right track. And um, yeah, I learned about Arrowhead. I learned about MDMA. I learned about mushrooms. So it's like I just dove into all of this like fascinating material and because I was at an Ivy League school with, you know, wealthy frat kids coming up from New York City, we had every drug you could possibly imagine. And, you know, I mean, for better or for worse, this was 20 years ago, I, I would not recommend what I did in college to anyone else at this time, you know, because it's much more dangerous. But it was kind of like this four years of self-experimentation and finding out, like, what does this stuff do? And then... At the same time, I actually was still doing well enough in my classes. So I was studying neuroscience and psychology, and I got a job in a monkey lab. And my mentor was like, well, you know, you can choose the neuroscience path, but you're clearly obsessed with, you know, human consciousness, and you're never going to be satisfied studying rhesus macaques. Like, they're never going to give you, even if they have a really, you know, amazing consciousness, you're never going to be able to tap into it. So... Basically, at, at the grad school point, I interviewed with like half neuroscience and half human psychology, cognitive sci. And UC Davis was where they didn't bat an eye at psychedelics. And everywhere else had like a judgment about it. That'll never happen here. Even Berkeley, you know, like now it's like they've got a huge center. But at the time, 
you know, 20 years ago, it was a very different world. You talk about meditation and psychedelics and people are like, okay, wacko, thank you very much. Like moving on. Um, so yeah, it was really just from my own personal obsession with changing my own consciousness and then wanting to understand how that happened. Wow. <laughs> and so I'm curious, you know, when you went, so you went to UC Davis and did they, did you then like, um, basically, you know, form your own, uh, path there or would, were there other scientists working on this? Like, how did you... You know, because you are one of the known, like, you know, what I would say, like, modern pioneers of the psychedelic movement and kind of been, like, OG in the space. But, you know, how did you, did you link up with some of these other um, scientists doing research around the world? Or how did that kind of all take off? Yeah, well, if you remember, so this was in 2004. There was no, there was hardly any psychedelic research happening. And the stuff at Hopkins was still very under the radar. They didn't come out with their first paper until 2006. So um, the folks at UC Davis actually did take a huge gamble on me because it wasn't like they could point to like, oh, there's that one lab in Switzerland. No, nobody even knew about Franz Volenbeiter. There wasn't an Imperial College you know, research team. There was nothing. There were like little tiny dribs and drabs. Hardly anyone knew about Rick Strassman in human psychology academia. You know, people knew about him in drug research. But... Yeah. Um, there was just kind of the belief that like we could study human consciousness and that was an okay thing to study. And so at UC Davis, there were people studying meditation, music, um, human emotions, multisensory processing and autism. So it was kind of like a natural fit. It was like a bunch of eccentric, but very smart scientists all trying to push the limits of like, how do humans experience reality? And so in the middle of the big meditation study that we did, Roland's paper first came out, the 2006 Mystical Experience paper. And I remember just being like, this is my golden ticket. Like I had just won the like Willy Wonka, like chocolate bar. And I was like, this is where I'm going. And so if the timing had been off by a few years, like it wouldn't have happened for me. I would have been plugging away at meditation science or some other kind of neuroscience. Maybe I would be jumping on the bandwagon now, you know, now that everyone's feeling like it's safe. But at the time, like it was like gamble after gamble. And um, I think that's also kind of why I left when I did, because it wasn't as like risky anymore. It was like, oh, it's gotten normalized. Like now I'm going to go do something else, find out what the next like risky thing is to try. Mm, I love it. I love this, like, you know, really being shown that you are driven by a personal, um, you know, like passion of yours, like your own quest for exploring consciousness and experimentation. And then, yeah, that like cutting edge, like, hey, this is uh, not risky enough, not cutting edge enough. Um, so I'm curious, like then what, what did your path take you to next? Did you then just go into private practice or were you doing, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the research that you were doing that has kind of shaped everything else. Yeah. So when I joined the Hopkins team, um, I was a, a researcher. I had no clinical training. And so I basically got thrown into these high dose sessions with Bill Richards and Mary Casabano as the lead guide. And I was like the person taking notes, making sure someone could get to the bathroom, like feeding them grapes. You know, I was like the assistant, the like nameless background person in all of psychedelic research. And very quickly we learned kind of two things. One was that I had an ability to notice when things were kind of like going sideways a little bit and kind of steer things back on track. And I think, honestly, it was from how much self-experience I had that, you know, it's like, you know, if your friend is starting to have a bad experience, you're not going to like just wait and see what happens. You're going to be like, all right, let's try to navigate, you know, through this so that you get the most out of the experience. And the second thing was that Bill and Mary also thought that I actually knew what I was doing clinically. Now, these were healthy people. They weren't getting treatment. You know, they didn't have a diagnosis. So, um, I still kind of hold to this now, but at the time there wasn't this idea that we were like treating anyone. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, um, it wasn't a medical model. It was a psychopharmacology model. So you don't need to be a therapist to be in the room with someone. And so in a way, again, I was very lucky that I came in when I did because I got all of this hands-on guiding training, which now you have to be a clinician. You have to be licensed. You have to be a doctor. I don't agree with that, but, um, you know, I think it's probably good that it keeps some of the riffraff out. You know, it's like not anybody can be a psychedelic guide. 
Um, and so that was kind of like a big chunk of my time. And the other half was trying to figure out what research would land me a gig at Hopkins. And that was the hard part. So I had the openness paper come out, which was huge, but um, to medical people, they're like, who cares about personality? Like that's not gonna get you onto faculty. Interesting. Um, I had a whole kind of um, protocol and vision to compare psilocybin and ketamine on changes in neurotransmitters in the brain. This was 10 years before anyone was talking about ketamine or psilocybin for depression. So it's like I kept kind of like throwing darts at the wall trying to see what would stick at this medical institution. And I did that until my life just took me in a completely other direction. But looking back, I think that what I learned was I don't want to work in a medical institution. Um, and like, I really liked guiding, but it was really hard and it was very emotionally taxing. So like, you know, I imagine getting back into it at another stage in my life, but like at the time, like I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad that I took a big, long detour while everything else kind of got built up in the meantime. And I'll let the psychiatrists and therapists and whoever like, you know, take the risks for the next 10 years while I just kind of chill, write some books, enjoy my life. <laughs> No, this is interesting what you just said about guiding, because um, this has come up for discussion a lot, and I've I've even spoken about this about there's I think now that there's just this kind of a surge of popularity and now training programs and then the you know legalization decriminalization, to me there's this there's this uh, you know like um, glamorization of being a psychedelic guide or a, a trip sitter or a space holder or, you know whatever we want to call it, an underground therapist and you know it's interesting because I'm like well do people realize that it can get really like boring and long and it's actually like emotionally taxing and there's a lot of energy you're holding and you know I mean depending on who you're working with like it can be a lot yeah and um I'm curious to hear a little bit about what you say about that you don't agree with you know the fact that only certain people are allowed to let's say legally hold this space and you know be psychedelic sitters because I I also disagree with that as well because it's it's like the analogy how many of us have had um bad doctors or bad dentists you know it's like yes the dentist went to dental school for you know however many years and has all this training and they're still bad. So I don't think the, the degrees or the training necessarily means that someone's good or capable or knows what they're doing. But I'm curious, what, your, what are your thoughts on that, especially now in today's world with, you know, you can go do a six-month training, and voila, you can become a, you know, get a license and be a official psychedelic guide out in Oregon. Right. What are your feelings on what's happening right now in the, this world? Yeah, so on the one hand, if what was required was a 20-year apprenticeship, with a shaman or a very skilled underground person with supervision, with constant feedback from your community, with um, everyone in the community, including the people who you have helped and your teachers all agreeing like this person is certified, I would actually be behind that. But we don't have that. What we have is people who put in 10 years or so in medical school or you know psychotherapy training and then a little bit of extra licensing and supervision around psychedelics and suddenly they're experts. And I think that's actually dangerous because it tells the people who are getting the experience that there's an authority figure in the room and they know what to do. And we know that that's not true with psychedelics. You know, you can be good at what you do and you can still admit like, I'm not an authority, I'm not an expert, I'm here to help you. You're the one who is having this experience and I'm just gonna make sure you're safe that you don't go down too many like dark alleyways, you know, that you're not intending to go down. Um, and that I help you get the support you need afterward, mostly by kind of putting you back into your community, into your life, into your family. And so I think the risk of licensing and all of those guidelines is that it tells people that they're an expert. If it didn't tell you you're an expert, if it just said you're like, a, I had this term about, you know, five years ago, a good Samaritan. Like you get certified as a good psychedelic Samaritan. Like you're not gonna uh, abuse or assault anybody. You're not gonna financially steal from people. You're not going to treat people that you're that are beyond your capacity. If you can like prove that to your community, sure, let's certify you as like a basically decent person who can sit in a room with someone, you know? Um, but, you know, I get nervous when medical and academic authority figures start asserting 
their role in a space that is not part of that kind of culture. And so that's one side of it. I think the other side is there's a lot of money to be made. And um, while I have been a, an extreme beneficiary of capitalism across my life, um, I can see that it's not benefiting most people. Like I happen to be one of the lucky ones, but there's nothing, there's no rhyme or reason around that. And there are systemic reasons why people don't benefit. So what I see happening with some of the licensing and training is that we're still elevating the top people to even greater status and we're giving them a lot of money and it's a little bit removed from it's like, you know, when Maria Sabina first gave Gordon Wasson mushrooms, you know, she died very poor. She was not taken care of during her life and she just gave and gave and gave. And so from that point in 19, in the 50s to where we are now, it's like, how have we gotten so far away from where this started? And that's just one example. There are many living examples of what she did that's st that are still happening. I know, I know, I know white people born in America living paycheck to paycheck, and that's kind of a metaphor because they don't get a paycheck, but they're just making medicine, giving it away, trying to kind of fill in the gaps. They're not, you know, they're not getting access to this licensing and, tra and training. So it's a lot to kind of pack in, but I think most humans who aren't intending to harm, and that's a tricky question, but if you're not intending to harm, you can learn how to be present for someone else through birth, through death, through psychedelics. So I love the conversation to be like, how can we train as many people as possible to do this for their friends and family? And just, you know, the, the authorities can kind of still do their thing, but most people won't ever engage with them. I am so glad you share this perspective. <laughs> and I, I actually am like, I think we need to elevate this conversation, like get it out everywhere, because it's it's been interesting um, – just observing what's happening out there. I have, so I have a few clients who actually have been working in Oregon who are involved in the training programs. And um, one of them helped open one of the first psilocybin service centers. And, you know, they're, they're just good people who've been on this path for a very long time. You know, some of them are trained medically and trained in other areas, but not necessarily like Oh, I'm a psychedelic therapist who's been at this for 40 years. It's like, you know, just good people with a good heart that know what they're doing, that somehow like fell into it. Um, but it's been interesting to hear a lot of the inside scoop, like the perspectives and the, also the reality of what's happening. And it's been very, uh, I mean, even there, they're a little, uh, well, I shouldn't say a little, like a lot disheartened about, you know, like the money, the, the, um, the amount of, they've both said like the amount of regulation and time that's been spent just even trying to understand the regulation. And then, um, you know, it's like in the end, like, what is this all for? Well, there's people that are out there who are like really desperate for a solution you know like the one that helped open the service center they said the first week they opened they got like 1500 signups you know with people like a waiting list people that are like i will travel there i'm desperate i don't know where else to turn you know maybe they can't go on some five thousand dollar retreat in jamaica but you know it's like that that quality of the demand being very high and the the quote supply and when i say supply is they like you know legal supply being unaffordable and accessible, you know, people not even knowing where to get it, people not having it in their communities or, you know, not, not having friends that grow mushrooms, you know, it's, and I think it's, it's been an argument and just kind of listening to the, the gist of the whole like underground. And when I say underground, it's, you know, it's everywhere. It's like, everybody's talking about this where, um, are we just turning this into the next, you know, big pharma that's like, okay, now it's turning into the, like a, just another version of a Prozac right? where you have to go to a provider and you have to get a prescription and then you have to refill it and then you have to stay on it. And it's like, is this really the, the, the answer? I mean, I don't think so, it's the answer. Okay. And I do think, um, I think there are other answers. And I think that interestingly, it's psychedelics that help you see that there are other possibilities you haven't considered. And sometimes I wonder, like, for all of the excitement, like, have these people allowed, the people who have these ideas, have they allowed psychedelics to really work through them 
And is this the best solution that they that the psychedelics shared with you or like helped illuminate in your own mind? Like it can't be. The things that like mushrooms have shared with me are like so wild and out there for like how humans can relate to reality and nature. There's no way that people are, you know, saying like, oh, this was so helpful. Let's create a bureaucracy that's really hard to access and understand. That's super expensive and people will get sued if anyone gets hurt. No way. The mushrooms don't even speak that language. So it tells you right there that the answers are not coming from within psychedelics. They're coming from outside of psychedelics in and applying into that space. So what I'm suggesting is that we actually ask within the psychedelic space, like what are the solutions for humankind right now? And if you look around, I mean, it's getting more dangerous to travel. It's getting more dangerous to for a lot of people to live where they're living. I mean, if California, Oregon, and Colorado are the only places people can go, what happens when there are wildfires, drought? You know, I mean, here in Vermont, we just had a lot of flooding. So it's kind of the other end of the spectrum. But it's becoming increasingly hard for people to leave where they live to seek treatment. And so how do we make psychedelics available to people where they are in a safe way? And yes, I think mushrooms are the easiest because they can grow anywhere. Um, they'll always be available. But mushrooms are hard for a lot of people. So it's like, you know, my my big thing now is like, what would it look like to have a like public supply of MDMA that's tested and high quality? And like, you get two two doses a year and you could either take them or sell them to a friend or give them away. Like, I know it's a little bit crazy, but like, not so crazy in my world. Like, I would I would benefit from that, you know, being able to say, all right, I'm going to go check in and get my like ration of MDMA for the year. And if people want more, they can pay for it. And if people want less, they don't even have to go. So, you know, in a tiny state like Vermont, it could work. And I'm trying to kind of talk to politicians in a way to help them think creatively well beyond the kind of standard models. Um, but at the same time, I know we're probably going to end up with synthetics, you know, psilocybin and MAPS MDMA in a hospital. And like after all is said and done, like that, that may be the best bet for most people. And then there's still the underground. So mm -hmm. I guess the final thing I want to say is that what I um, what feels the scariest is that it could become much more dangerous to operate in the underground at all. People who are making, you know, MDMA now, um, what kind of penalties will be enacted to justify the investment that has been put into, you know, maps going for profit and selling shares, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a stretch to imagine in five years from now that the penalties for making MDMA will be um, prohibitive for most people to engage in that kind of risky practice. And we saw people go to you know, prison for life for making LSD. So it's like, it, it's very optimistic if you think about the community level, and it's also fucking terrifying if you think about how governments try to shut down things that compete with what they're offering. Hey everyone, just a quick break to remind you that the True Path Entrepreneur Group Mastermind Program is open for enrollment now. We start at the beginning of 2024 in January, but we are starting to take applications now. If you'd like to learn more, you can check out the Mastermind webpage on my site at bethaweinstein.com slash mastermind. This is a 12-month group community-oriented mastermind program where you learn how to start, grow, and get clients in your business so that you can help more people, make a difference in the world, and do work that you absolutely love. This mastermind program is designed for new and early stage coaches, healers, psychedelic entrepreneurs, therapists, and anybody who wants to do transformational work in the world and wants to learn the exact steps you need to know to grow your business to the next level to be able to share your unique medicine and make a difference in the world. So again, that's bethaweinstein.com slash mastermind. The True Path Entrepreneur Group Business Coaching Mastermind Program is open now. I know, and it's, it's interesting because this discussion has come up so much as like, okay, well, maybe this legalization regulation will make it better but then there's you know i kept saying 
you know, with Colorado, when Colorado was passing, I was like, wait a second. Like, I think we need to read between a lot of the lines and read some of the fine print here and see what's really happening. And from what I'm understanding, it's still kind of a mess. They haven't totally figured it all out. There's still a lot of bills coming in and on the table and back and forth. But, you know, I know someone that was arrested, you know, the same year that that was passed and has been on house arrest for um, possession of ayahuasca. Wow. You know, plant medicine. Um, there's been people in Mexico that have been in jail for over a year, you know, again, just for like simple possession of, of a plant medicine that's, you know, to me, generally what I would call harmless. Um, and I do agree. Like, I, you know, there's talks of, well, maybe all this, this in, influx of legalization, decriminalization will help the underground, but I also believe that it could completely backfire. Yeah. And, well, and that's it, where I think we need the underground no matter what. Yeah. You know? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the extreme harm reduction people, like the folks at um, the SDDP or SD, yeah, I always forget the exact acronym, but the Students for Sensible Drug po SSDP, um, and some of the, you know, that are really pushing for the decriminalization of all drugs. The reason they're doing that is because people's entire lives are getting ruined for something that they are using either because it makes them feel better, it makes them feel less worse, or, you know, it helps them function, right? So it's like, if you think about it that way, you know, I've got two little kids. If I need to use mushrooms sometimes because I get migraines and I could go to prison for that and lose my children, like that's insane. And yet it's happening. And probably the only reason it doesn't happen in the circles that are making the laws is because they're privileged. You know, and they have status and they have power. So they're like, oh, none of these bad things are ever going to happen. And they're just ignoring the reality for a lot of people, which is, yes, moms are going to prison because they're using drugs. They are losing custody of their children because they're using what I should call controlled substances, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of drugs that we're allowed to use. Yeah. Apparently, alcohol is safe to use yeah. around children. Apparently, sugar. you know... I could drink as much Benadryl as I want, which is incredibly dangerous. But it's just like, sure, buy 10 bottles at the pharmacy and go home and drink them all. Like no one's, you know, no one's holding your hand. So it's very hypocritical. And, you know, at the same time that psychedelics aren't totally safe, I think they're a lot safer than some of the alternatives. And we should treat people like grownups. It's like we're letting people make all sorts of other decisions for their own, you know, health and well-being. So... Why suddenly the gatekeeping around psychedelics? Mm -hmm. I feel like there has to be another reason, and it's not just the money. I think that the folks in charge see this as a way to sustain the a lot of the power dynamics and the status of certain people. Like keep making the healthiest people healthier and functioning while the world basically goes to shit. <laughs> yeah, the one percent. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. Like, if we if we follow the trails, every almost every discussion I've had for the last you know four years, four and a half, five years straight, it always leads back to money and power and control, right? And and systems, you know, systems that are completely broken that are not serving the large majority of the population. They're serving a really great piece of the population at the top. Um, so this is something that always, I mean, I even say it's like, well. And I think I've even read where you've said this. I think it's you that have said similar things, I'm sure. But, you know, it's kind of like people are turning to, let's say, microdosing to help with their depression or anxiety. And then I'm like, well, wait, what is at the root of the depression and anxiety in the first place? Yes. And that's where I'm like, why aren't we actually putting the time and energy and effort into at least not – bypassing what's at the root. Right. I mean, maybe we're not going to fix the system overnight, even though all of us really would love to see things fixed overnight, but to, to at least acknowledge, okay, what is causing your depression? Oh, you're working in a job that you hate to be part of the rat race, to be able to just survive in our modern day, you know, system, especially in certain parts of the U S let's say, you know, where, where we both live. It's like, I mean, I see it all the time, even with clients. It's like, wow, you are just, it's like that hamster wheel that people can't get off of. And then they wonder why there's, they have no meaning, why they're depressed and why they feel lonely and isolated, even though they have a, you know, a million dollar home and make hundreds of thousands of dollars at their corporate job. It's like, right. And that's like a privileged person. So imagine being you know, a factory worker getting minimum wage, being in a community that doesn't really have, you know, any of, of that that maybe the, the you know, 10% client of mine has. And it's like, 
to just acknowledge that right. I think is something that we all need to begin with you know yeah and there's I mean there's also something I go back to so as you were talking I was imagining like what infrastructure for the system do psychedelics provide and so think about every hospital you know they have a cancer wing they have a cancer unit it was donated by some very wealthy couple or single person who benefited in a certain way they want to help everyone it felt it feels very good you know it's like well, I've had two family members go through major cancer wings of hospitals and they died the same as everybody else dies. It's painful. It's hard. It's confusing. All you want to do is be home with your family. So like what is what does a cancer wing buy us? It buys us a little bit of time and it puts a whole lot of money in a whole lot of pockets while you're getting slowly sicker and sicker. Some people get cured. Don't get me wrong. But most people being treated for cancer will eventually die of cancer. And you could check me on this. Some enterprising person can check the statistics. But um, it's rare that cancer doesn't eventually progress in some way. So you've got a cancer wing. Imagine if every hospital has a psychedelic wing and suddenly everyone feels really good about like, well, this is where you go if you have chronic depression. And we're never going to actually treat your depression. We're just going to help you manage your depression and live as long as possible being like slightly miserable your whole life like you have slightly elevated cancer levels but we'll just keep them right there we're not going to cure you and we're not going to let you die but we're going to make sure that you keep and every time you come in it's you know twenty thousand dollars or like this infusion is five thousand bucks and actually we came up with a really great drug that only lasts two minutes and it's called you know something something dmt so you still pay twenty thousand dollars but you only get five minutes of the experience and then you're back in your car driving home right so I, it's cynical, but it's like I see that model being applied to psychedelics, and it's like that's why the money is there because they see that this is the next like thing that can just get added on to every big institution that is becoming irrelevant. It's like how are we going to keep these hospitals and medical institutions and universities going? And just like just look over here. Don't look at the climate catastrophe. Like look at all the nice pretty buildings with the beautiful hospitals. And it's like, oh, okay, maybe that's part of it. I know, and I'm sitting here like giggling and laughing, but feeling so much. I know you heart. have to just laugh at some it's, point. I know it's just that's... so fucking. It is depressing. It's like this is where we're at as a species, and it's like yeah. we can't address the root cause of our misery because our misery is self-created, and for most of us, we didn't do it, but it's like we're participating in it. Yeah. And you know, that's every true. year there's wildfires, drought, famine. You know, all this, we're going to go into a third world war soon. I mean, that's coming down the horizon. And at the same time, you're like, well, we need people to still like participate in life. So how do we do that? It's like, well, maybe there's a drug that will help them feel good like for three months. And it's it's interesting because in the last couple years, and, and I'm actually very, um, I'm very particular about platforming anybody that just works with ketamine I decided this years ago because I've always had very mixed feelings on I, I mean yes I do believe it has this great potential you know veterans and PTSD and but why have I met a few people in the last couple of years who spend 90 over ninety thousand dollars a year on their ketamine and I'm like wait how much ketamine are you taking I mean I met someone who's like oh I do it weekly and I'm like <laughs> Weekly. Like, I didn't know this was a thing. And then it's like, well, how is this different than being on just another antidepressant? And by the way, there are some, you know, it's like, it's not just the the one drug that'll fix everything. And it's like, well, wait, how is this any different than what you might have been doing before and what we've been doing all these years that we're trying to change? You know, right. is this helping that you need to be spending 100K on ketamine year after year after year after year? Instead of actually like diving into the root and making changes and, you know, like actually making your life different so that this isn't something you need. And then it's like, well, what about the people that need that, like for real, that can't afford $100,000 a year in ketamine, you know? Wow. It's, or why, it's, why do yeah. we have legal ketamine infusion clinics, but no supervised heroin injection sites? Like, oh my God, no. in my view, it's like people should be allowed to use the drugs they want to use. If we actually had heroin injection sites alongside the ketamine clinics, I'd be like, well, at least it's not hypocritical. Like, this is just yeah. what people need, and that's what they want. And maybe some people, like, you know, for me, like I said in the beginning, my hook was alcohol. It, like, got its hook in me and has been kind of dragging me through my life to different extents at different points in time. For some people, it's heroin. For other people, it's ketamine, you know? So it's like, some people, it's marijuana, you know? It's like, what 
it, in your own karma, your own background, your family history, your medical history, your genetics, like, I feel like each of us finds a substance that is like our, you know, like almost like our angel and our devil, right? So it's like, for me, my angel was like MDMA, not perfect all the time, but like, you know, if it's been like a while and I'm like, man, I just do not feel like myself. MDMA helps me remember who I am. Thank God, you know, for some people it might be something else. But alcohol is like the devil on my shoulder. You know, yeah, it's like, I'll make you feel better. Just give your, you know, just give into all of the storyline about how this will reduce your anxiety and like make life easier and like numb you out. It's like, oh, right. I know you tell this story, but it's never true. And like, I forget and I believe it for a little bit. So with all that being said, I mean, ketamine is like the worst possible psychedelic for us to start with, like of all of the ones that could that we could have started with. It's like, why ketamine? You know, it's like, mm. yes, it's helpful. But um, I talked to like, say, five different people who have been in the psychedelic field for decades. Every single one of them knows someone that lost their life to ketamine. Every single one. So again, maybe not a, a high total percentage, but if all of us know one person, I don't know a single person who lost their life to mushrooms. I'm sure it happens, but it's like, how is it that you can ask medical doctors, psychonauts, underground people, like, and everyone's like, oh yeah, that person really slid into that and you know, it cost them their life. And like, here we go, we're just giffing it out to the whole population. And again, it's like, what is the motivation here? You know, are we trying to disconnect people from paying attention to what's really going on? If you want to do that, ketamine is a great drug to disconnect people from what's really going on. Yeah. And that's the argument I heard that made me actually second guess even putting people on my platform because it's, it's you know, this dissociative when I actually believe, you know, we need to be doing the opposite. We need to be engaged and feel all the feelings fully, including like the massive you know, collective grief and sorrow and like you said, like these huge issues that are happening on the planet that we can't disassociate from forever because they're going to just get worse and worse and worse and we can't pretend it's not happening. Right. So I actually think we need to actually, I mean, this is my theory and this is why I am on the path I'm on where it's like, well, yeah, these are not the most pleasurable substances that I work with, but I get that practice of being able to really be engaged in like, you know, grief and sorrow and anger and rage and sadness and like joy and ecstasy and pleasure, but to actually witness like here's what's really happening and and then be able to channel my hopefully my time and energy into like, well, here's the little seed I'm gonna plant that hopefully makes some kind of contribution to the planet. Right. And that's kind of where, you know, the work I do is kind of you know, I'm interested in this discussion around how psychedelics you know, might contribute to this larger, what I call like purpose, just for use of a simple word, but for people waking up to having some kind of, you know, meaning or contribution, even if it's just, you know, putting their art in the world, you right. know, or speaking their voice or finally doing something that they love that lights them up, that makes them enjoy this human experience instead of being numbing themselves with whatever it is shopping TikTok, you know netflix alcohol drugs sugars what you know and not to say that's a, a good list i want i'm gonna take it notes like because I, I need like other examples that aren't chemicals <laughs> for people to realize like when i told my eight-year-old daughter that she had gotten addicted to this like stupid my little pony show on our vacation she's like oh i was like yeah it's like just like a drug honey and you know how you told me She's like Miss Purist. She's like, I'm never drinking coffee. I'm never drinking alcohol. I want to be clear headed. I was like, well, My Little Ponies is a drug. And she's like, she immediately stopped like that afternoon. She's like, I'm not letting this contaminate my mind. <laughs> it's like, I love it. I no, it's, I mean, it's funny because, you know, this is actually what woke me up, you know, and I've been working with psychedelics since I was a kid, like, you know, 30 years. I got really into running marathons and ultra marathons. And what I started noticing, because it was my way of like not drinking alcohol too much, because I was, you know, I was like a super partier, drugs, alcohol. Right. And I was still partying, but the running helped me shift from like partying too much, you know, living in New York City to like running obsessive, you know, marathon every month. And what I started noticing, not only did it attract a lot of former addicts, but it was like, 
just a different addiction, but we all wrote it off as like, oh, well, this is healthy. But, you know, pounding your body for five hours a time, you know, five hours a weekend on a run, like that would be like our life. Like, oh, we just go on like a four hour run and then traveling and going on these like seven hour runs. And then like it was this whole and I was like, oh, my God, it's the same thing. It's just we're pretending like it's okay and better, but, you know, we're getting hurt. You know, people are bloody toenails. People are getting IVs. I mean, I've seen everything, you know, like back injury. And I'm like, wait, how is this? And then I realized, I was like, wait, how do we use anything as a coping mechanism? And why aren't we just feeling what's really happening here? And that's, of course, like, I believe it's hard to do that. (laughs) Yeah, of course. It's like the hard work that no one, I mean, I don't want to do it. Feeling grief and sadness and and being aware of what's actually happening on the planet, it sucks. It's hard. (laughs) But it's also like, well, are we going to just bypass everything that's happening or maybe try to at least, you know, like you said, like connect to the psychedelics and maybe there's something that they can, you know, work with us to come up with a solution versus, by the way, there's a great meme out there by um, uh, Dennis, um, Dennis Micropreneur podcast that I literally just saw the other day that was, you know, a meme about someone having this ayahuasca journey and then saying like, Let's start a bureaucracy where we can oh then God. sell stuff. Well, I wish I had money. seen that. And it's so, so funny that I like mimicked that exact, but it's like the exact. Theme. I mean, so it's interesting. It's like in my, you know, so kind of my, what I ended up writing in my book was like one woman's take on like a creative alternative way of seeing things. And I like told it through what I tried and what I did. But interestingly, I think, and I'm sure Dennis McKenna or Terrence McKenna have said this before, but I try to illuminate how the mushrooms actually can speak to you and give you solutions for your life. If you would just like tune into the frequency a little bit and be like, hey, like intelligent being thing that's been here way longer than humans, like what do you have to say about this? And sometimes they're just like, oh, whatever, that's stupid. I have nothing to say. Or like, I don't know, being a mom, that seems like just do it, right? Can't be that hard, you know? But sometimes they've got good ideas. And what would it be like for humans to just like take down a a notch on the pedestal and just say like, maybe plants and mushrooms have some good ideas because they've survived a lot longer on this planet than we have. And we have clearly ruined everything in a very short period of time. And you don't have to have a specific spiritual framework to take advantage of that. It can just be like if you have an insightful dream. You know, it's like mm-hmm. if you if you talk to musicians, there's, their songs come to them in dreams or meditation or daydreaming or just walking in nature. So it's like I would love for people to go into these spaces and ask, like, hey, like, I'm stuck here, man. Like, I've tried everything. Nothing's working it's beyond me. So like, can you see it differently? Like from your perspective, what does it look like? And one of the things I ended up doing toward the end of my journey was painting and planting a flower garden. And like, that is not the kind of person I was, but MDMA like gave me a different, like, they're like, Hey, have you considered maybe creating beautiful things would help you not feel like the anxiety and existential dread of the abyss. (laughs) You know, it's like planting flowers is so cool. Like it's like you plant it, you wait and wait and wait. And like, you're like, this is never going to happen. And suddenly there's a flower and you're like, wow, like that just happened. So yeah, I think that there is hope. And I really loved what you said about the little seed. It's like what beauty, joy, purpose, meaning, contribution do you want to leave? And if it's just that you figured out how to paint and plant a flower garden, like fantastic, you know? (laughs) Huge. I know. Imagine if every human being had a flower garden in their front yard. (laughs) I mean, what would our world become? No, it's true. And by the way, I want to point out, when I've interviewed Charles Eisenstein, Rack Razam, and there was one other person, I think, you know, a couple people have said this, other people over the years, about really tuning in and listening. And asking these ancient wise beings, these spirits through these plants, like maybe they actually have some answers to the world's problems, you know? Like I think it was Rack Razam who said, yeah, we could try 3D printing a glacier like they're talking about or we could actually like sit down with intention, especially if we do it in groups or as a collective and and tune in and maybe there's some brilliant solution that will come through I don't know it's you know it's like there's no harm in trying 
but I love I love that idea. It's like it's true. It's like well, you've been here for millions of years, and we're we're kind of new, and we're not getting something right. So maybe we're clearly we messing listening. it up. Like maybe we're not the, we're not as smart as we think. Exactly. <laughs> well, I want to talk a little bit about your book, Midnight Water. Um, you know, I want to hear a little bit about what it's about, what the themes are, and and you know, like what inspired you to to finally write this book that was coming through you. Yeah, I mean, I love that you recognize that like the book was like in me and now it's out in the world because that's really how it has felt. It's like when people are like, how did you write this? I'm like, I had to. Like at some point, I just could not carry this around with me anymore. Like it had to be out in the world, distributed, available to be molded and interpreted and adapted however people needed to. But the story, you know, started with my sister. She died of breast cancer when I was a faculty uh, member at Hopkins and that was like the first fork in the road. You know, I could have just kind of grieved but stayed in academia. And I just knew that like it was a turning point and I needed to follow whatever that other path was. And then there was another turning point when I got fired from the MAPS trial in New York City, which, you know, it seems like, oh, death of my sister getting fired from a job. Like clearly death of my sister was harder. But in a way, getting rejected from the field that I had committed so much of my life to that I knew I was so good at and I was so passionate and I loved it more than, you know, anything else I'd ever done. That felt harder in a way because it was like, no, you don't get to participate in this thing that everyone else is excited about. And yet it was like a fork in the road. Like, what path do you want to walk? Do you want to walk the path of corporate pharmaceuticals or do you want to walk the path of being closer to nature? Like being with your kids when they're young, like, learning how to plant flowers. And so that's like, you know, when I learned that there were there was a life beyond corporate academia. And then the final fork in the road, which is the final third of the book, was my dad's death. And in a way, it what hap- what kind of got unearthed with my sister's death was resolved with my dad's death. And what I, I explore through the space of the book is like, what is it like to lose the most important person in your life and have everything upended? but then realize that that person was kind of like holding up a facade in front of a lot of issues that you were never going to look at unless they were no longer around. And so in a way, my sister's death forced me to really look at my childhood, how I had been raised, my dad in every possible memory and way we had related. And I was like, oh, I had really been hiding this from myself because, because it's like the facade was still there. And then losing my sister, it's like the facade crumbled and what was exposed was like, oh, like I wasn't seeing reality. I was seeing what I wanted reality to be. And um, I'm really proud of myself. And I'm also kind of like in awe of my dad and like the way he died. And I think some of my family members are really upset by the book because it's so brutal and honest. But um, to me, that's what psychedelics offered me was a resolution with one of the most difficult people in my life so that I could be with him when he was dying so that I could love him so that I could forgive him. And it's like, how do you tell a story about forgiveness without telling how it started? You can't just jump the reader to the end because then they're not going to believe it or they're going to be like, oh, whatever, you know? So it's like, you have to take people through the hell realms and the dark spaces and the like dead ends and the like, oh my God, I don't know if I can live if this is you know, if this is really what I've lived through. Isn't that interesting? It's like you've already lived Mm -hmm. through it. And then you tell yourself you can't bear what you've already lived through. And it's because we're kind of haunted by everything in our past. And so what does it look like to be present and forward thinking, you know, moving toward the future? So there's a little bit of science in there, but I think people are going to be shocked by how personal it is and how I basically put in the spirit of self-experimentation, I like put my life into the world and said like, okay, world, like what can we teach people? Like how can we teach people through this body, through this biography um, in a way that's almost like it's tra- it transcends my own personal story, I think. And a friend of mine read it and she's like, I would have thought this was a novel if I didn't know you were a real person. Mm-hmm. And so that's also cool that it's like, I want people to know that it's like, there's so many people out there who've survived things that you could never even imagine who've tried things you could never imagine, and they are just normal like the rest of us. <laughs> you are not special. No, <laughs> no. It's, um, that's, first of all, that's beautiful, and this is an area that 
I am really passionate about myself is kind of exploring psychedelics and the the death, like the process of dying, because I've actually had um, both my dad and stepfather die in the last, you know, my dad about 16 years ago and my stepfather just a few years ago. And to watch the processes and the system and the, like my own internal process, their process. And um, my dad, uh, I don't know about your specific case, but my dad had told us at a very young age that he never wanted to be kept alive if he ever got sick. Like he was a scientist. He was very adamant about like, I just want to die naturally. He used to say, take me out to the desert and throw me to the wolves with a bottle of bourbon. Like, and that was like, he was really like serious about it. I'm like, I don't think we can legally do that. (laughs) But then when he died, it was this crazy process of like, you know, he got rushed to the hospital, didn't want to be in the hospital. How do you bring him home? We tried to bring him home, you know, and then they're like, he has two months to live. And then literally the day we were going to bring him home, he died. And I was like, great. He got his wish. He wasn't going to be kept in, you know, something. And, but it's, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this, about how, and I know even Paul Stamets, when I interviewed him, it was, it was mostly around like, the end of life therapy, you know, like how we can work with psychedelics for people who have terminal illnesses and and the death process and how to make it part of our life instead of, again, bypassing that it's, it, it exists, you know, or like trying to deny it or run from it as a society. But how do we maybe make it a more meaningful, powerful um, healing experience where I don't know about you, but I always say I have a better, I have this like tighter relationship with my father now yes. since he died you know like just the spirit no realm. i think um, i think you'll re- i think you'll really be into the story because i think there are a lot of father daughter pairs out there who are really struggling right now because mm-hmm. it's like we're a microcosm of the issues with the patriarchy and our dad suffered for being in that role in the patriarchy at least my dad did for sure Mm-hmm. and just a lot of there might be real conflict and I don't want to minimize the harm but there's also these roles that we're playing as part of this system that's falling apart and so like what is it what do psychedelics have to say about these relationships like do they have anything to help repair those relationships like can like now I can say for sure no matter how terrible the man was in life I could probably, you know, support that person on their deathbed because I see the potential for relief of suffering when a person doesn't have to embody that system that has been so damaging. And it's not to take away the benefits of that system. You know, certainly people have lived very joyous lives in the patriarchy. But when you see these men on their deathbed, you suddenly it's like everything gets simplified and they're like, oh, like that corporate job doesn't really matter like it certainly created um happiness for the time that it did but like right now it just matters like am I home am I with my dog am I with my kids and grandkids like can I die in peace and my dad got that and the the person I was 10 years ago would have not wished that for him so I was like thank god I could mature enough in 10 years to be so happy that he got a good death you know, even under the circumstances, everyone's like, oh, he died too young. I'm like, he died well. He got 65 years and he died so well. Like, you know, if all of us could be as lucky as that one man, right? So it changes your perspective. And like, um, I think that being around death makes me a better person. And it kind of takes me out of my own stories. Um, And so I think everyone benefits from going through that in advance of your own experience because then you can see like what do I want what don't I want like a lot of people don't want psychedelics when they're dying they just want pain relief and they want to be with their family that's it pain relief family (laughs) like or if it's not family just whoever loves you the most you know and that's that itself allows death to happen in a psychedelic way wow that's I that I'm like that sounds like a really good title for a talk (laughs) Right there. Um, but yeah, this, and this is something I think is going, I mean, at least my prayer is going to be a topic of discussion more and more over time as, as you know, hopefully as the, the popularity of psychedelics and conversations start expanding. You know, I've had more and more of these. I've actually had clients that work as like death doulas that have gone through various like death trainings. And I have a client that works in green burials and, you know, works with psychedelics. And But just, you know, like you just said, to have this, 
psychedelic like experience it doesn't even have to have any medicine involved at all right. but to actually um try to see it differently and like you know like you said like learn something from it have some kind of healing have some perspective shift versus um having people maybe like yeah like I thankfully very probably sounds similar to you I healed my relationship with my father thankfully just kind of by chance like just a few years before he died wow. and so then the death process was was sweet and beautiful but had I not been there it would have been like a regret you know yeah. and um no, and I meet and I meet lots of people who legitimately, you know, hate their parents, hate mom, yeah. hate dad, hate whatever, you know, everyone's got a reason. Mm. But I think the point of what I'm trying to share in the story is that that hate only persists and endures through your life. Mm. Like it doesn't end with death. It doesn't end when that relationship goes away. You can't hide from it. You can't ignore it. You can't stuff it away. So if there's someone that's causing you a lot of distress, like maybe move into that and see like, what is this? Why do I hate this person? Why do they cause me so much difficulty? And if I were saying this, like do it sober, like I would think that that's really unethical, but thank God we have medicines that can help you walk that path, you know, mm -hmm. people who can help you walk that path. So it's like, okay, you've got that, you know, it's like the neighborhood in your mind that you don't want to walk in unless you're like drunk or high or it's like you got a friend with you. Like, let's spend some time in that neighborhood. Like, what's so scary about that? Who lives there? Like, what are the things that you've exiled into that part of your consciousness or your body that you're like, no, 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 I just don't go there at night. It's like, let's go there. It's not that bad. Like, I'll, I'll do it with you. Like, it's cool. And so I kind of, you know, I see death as one of those invitations to go into those like difficult parts of your mind um another metaphor i use is the labyrinth so it's like what are the parts of the labyrinth where you've hidden away all your worst you know fears and shame and hatred and all of that good stuff like let's go there like come on we've got we've got help we've got supplements that can help you go there so good well, Catherine, this has been a, an amazing discussion. I want to leave you some time to share about, you know, the book and also um, where can people find you? What do you have coming up over the next, you know, <laughs> six to 12 months? Are you just chilling out? And are, are, you, are, are you doing like a book tour or anything like that? Yeah, so I just got back from London, Paris, and Barcelona. And before London, I was in Bermuda. So the book was written in Bermuda. And my cover artist, Eileen Hall, is from London. Here, I'll show you her cover art, which is just, like, amazing. I love it so much. Oh, so nice. Yeah. And so we, I wanted to kind of birth the book first in the places where it was inspired. So basically Vermont, Bermuda, and London. So kind of did that, feeling just, like, a lot of gratitude for the first month that this, you know, amazing thing has been in the world. Um, I promised myself I would stay put in Vermont for most of August, and I'm sticking to that. Um, but I'm going to actually be starting a little book club through Psychedelic Sangha in New York, so people can buy the book, read it, and also discuss it with me, which is super fun. So we'll do that toward the end of August. Um, I'm hoping to do an event in New York, but it's I'm just trying to kind of wait and see like what the right space is, because it's um, bookstores don't feel quite right. Um, it takes a kind of certain place to want to feature something as weird as this book, right? And as like outspoken as me. Um, but then um, I'm going to Mycelium Mysteries, which is an, a women's gathering around mushrooms in Wisconsin at the end of September, which is super fun. Like we camp out in these like little like Girl Scout dorm rooms and like have fires. And I know it's, it's actually really trippy to just be with a bunch of women in the middle of like the woods and there are no rules other than just like you want to, you know, be a good person and take care of your community. Um, and then at the end of November, I'll be doing a little California tour. So um, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, L.A., San Diego. I have so many good friends out there and um, it'll feel like a little bit of a homecoming. You know, it's like coming back to the place that opened me up to so many possibilities. So That'll take me all the way through December and then probably just chill for the winter. And then 2024 is like my oyster. Like, I don't know what it's going to have in store for me. <laughs> well, I hope you can, uh, maybe we can arrange something in the Hudson Valley area. There's yeah, a, it'd be super a, fun. There's a community here that would be interested in it. Yeah. So. And I've, what I've done is it's like, if someone has an idea and they want to run with it, I'm like, I'll be there, you know, but 
what I've learned with books is that it's like they kind of follow their own path as they spread in the world. And so mm. I've just been giving books away. People think that's dumb, but it's like I'd rather give someone a book than have them spend money on Amazon, which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do when your book first comes out. So if someone's like, oh, I really want to elevate this conversation in my community, I'm like, I'm there. But like, oh, cool. I'm not going to come to sell books. Like, I'll probably just end up giving away 10 books or something. And my uh, publicist will be like, why are you doing this? Like, make people <laughs> buy your book. Um, but, you know, I think it's all part of what the book is also trying to say, which is that you can upend the system. And in my mm -hmm. case, you know, contrary to popular wisdom, you can use the tools of the patriarchy to disrupt the patriarchy. Like, mm -hmm. I've... I've taken what the patriarchy has given to me and I've turned it into something totally subversive that is almost itself like a mind altering drug. And so like the more people that can experience that, the better, like I benefit because it's creating the world I want to live in. Yeah. Um, and I can't forget to mention um, on my website. So Catherine McLean.org. Um, I, I took a little bit of a break while I was traveling, but I'm trying to kind of throw up little like local events and like the book club um, the woman who did the art for the cover has art that she made that's inspired by the book. So I'm trying to kind of um, have the website be a place where people can experience the ethos of Midnight Water um, with nice. the, you know, with the like, the slight caveat that like, if there's anything on here that you want access to, but you can't afford it, just ask me, you know, because it's really in the spirit mm -hmm. of the book to, to give away what it has, you know, brought into my life. Oh, this is amazing. Beautiful. <laughs> well, we'll have all the links to everything. And, you know, if you need anything or if you have like the locations of any of these upcoming book visits, talks out in California, we are happy to share that here in the podcast or so everybody can uh, awesome. go check you out. But Dr. McLean, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for putting this book out into the world having your voice shared. I think this is very important right now. I hope we can get you on everybody's podcast very soon. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you. I'm so glad this finally worked out in divine timing. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thanks so much. And we'll have another episode next Tuesday, everyone. Thank you. See you soon.